Join us for the very first IFL Live at London's Indigo at the O2, Sunday, August the 13th, with me, Cook and Cassius, and some very special guests, Eddie Hearn, Darren Barker, Johnny Fisher, and more. Tickets now on sale. So in the words of Eddie Hearn... You get up, you dress up, and you fucking show up. Hello and welcome to Raw, the Fight Within podcast with me, Coog and Cassius. This week I'm delighted to be joined by world champion, all-round kind of good guy. Two-time world champion. Two-time world champion. You had to correct me there, didn't you? Yeah. Might have done it on purpose. Joe Cordina, thank you very much for coming on. How are you, mate? Uh, thanks for having me, mate. I'm, uh, I'm okay. I just finished training. Um, yeah. I'm I'm good overall. Life good. all right? Yeah, sweet mate, sweet. Same as usual, just on the on the road and just uh, brushing past everything that's in my way. Good to hear. Good to hear. Um, right, let's start off quite easy and then uh, we'll delve into a little bit of Cordina. Um, what were your first like ever memories of boxing? My first one was I was. Um, I must have been, I was really young anyway. Nassim Hamid was fighting. I can't remember who he was fighting. And I woke up in the middle of the night because my mum and dad used to watch all the fights and it must have been in America. So maybe like Kevin Kelly or someone like that. Um, and I went in, I went into their room and they were watching it. And I remember just jumping in the middle of them and I was watching the fight with them. And so that was my first memory of boxing, Nassim Hamid. Um, and then when I actually went into the boxing gym at 16, I thought I was Nassim Ahmed, just put my hands down and just flicking jabs on my feet. That was good. That was a good mover anyway, because I'd done a bit of break dancing and stuff. So I was always good on my feet. So you did what? Break dancing. Was you actually? Yeah, yeah. I, I two minutes into this, I had no clue. You just yeah. break dance. Two, about two, three years I was. Was you any good? I was all right, but I was, still, I was young, so I was, I was still learning. Was you any videos? Nah. Well, I can still got a few moves, but I ain't as flexible as I was. I can't even touch my toes now. Wow, I never knew that. Yeah. Um, do you remember the first ever fight you like attended, like went to? Um, a pro, a pro fight was my cousin's, um, uh, Francisco Budge. He um, he won Welsh Celtic titles. Um, he actually boxed Chris Eubank Jr. Um, got stopped in the 12th with about 20 seconds to go. Um, so, yeah, it was it was one of his fights. But then as an amateur, to be honest, I couldn't remember the first boxing event I went to. But I remember my first fight and I was quite scary. I was quite nervous even watching my first, uh, watching going to shows and watching, and even if I was on boxing. I used to get nervous anyway. Well, like... Whether you're a fan, obviously you're in the sport at the at the highest elite level. But was there anyone specifically that got you into boxing? Like I think it's quite. I don't know if it's obvious to think that some of the boxers, kind mm. of the Welsh boxers, kind of your yeah, Calzaghis, etc. Mm. But was there anyone specifically? You mentioned Naz there, but was yeah. there anyone specifically that kind of swayed you into watching boxing as, as, a, a, as an individual? No boxer did, no. I, a boxer never. Um, my dad it was. I was um, growing up. I was always like, from especially where I'm from is quite a rough area. Like there's not like killings like you you get uh, like everywhere like in London and places like that and Liverpool, Manchester. It's quite a small area, but in these little boroughs, they're quite. It's quite rough. Like and people are always trying to test you. Um, and I was always small, but. A lot of people uh, knew who my old man was, and um, he always says, "Like anyone comes, try and he said, don't ask questions." Bing, bing, bing. He said, and then we'll deal with it after. So I just, uh, growing up, I was always like that. And I was always a, a chopsy little fucker anyway. So um, a mixture of them too. I never, I was never in problems, but it, it could, it could have always gone left if someone tried to. Um, so not intimidate. Yeah, intimidate me or, or try their luck or whatever. But I was the w- way my mind brought me up going on to the again to the point is how I was how I was growing up and then when I was playing rugby and football, mainly rugby because they, the boys are a lot bigger than me. They tried it. I was getting sent off all the time. So in the end, 
it was a matter of fact that my dad was like, listen, you're getting out, he's getting out of the van now. Um, didn't actually say that to me, but he was like, listen, why don't we go to the boxing gym? So, and he'd done that when the season was off in rugby, so he used that as an excuse. Well, you've got to keep fit some by doing something. So the, I think he wanted me to do that as take maybe take my anger out or whatever, or try and discipline me, but also keep fit with when the rugby season was off. So he was the one that got me into the boxing and anything, my mother and my father, anything they asked me to do or wanted to do, I would do it because I wouldn't want to let them down or anything. So like, especially now when I'm fighting, if my mum and dad's there watching me, you'll have to nail me to the floor because there's, there's, no, there's no way I'm going to give in or if it gets tough, it's not, I, I got too much of that and my balls are too big to even think uh, uh, them sort of thing. So it was my, mainly my dad, but between them two, um, I think that's why I excelled in, uh, in the boxing. Like growing up, did you, you said about possibly being a little bit volatile, should we say, but do you remember any kind of altercation you got into as a kid? Anything that sticks out? Um, A couple, but it there wasn't there wasn't like major things where they're just little fisty cuffs and stuff. But like I was saying, I didn't really have trouble because around my area, a lot of people knew my father and my own uh, and my family because I got quite a big family. Um, like my dad's one of like twenty, twenty something, um, and my mum's one of fourteen or fifteen. So, one of twenty. Yeah, yeah. So there's um. Twenty. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of them. My Good. grand, my grandfather. He's um. No he's TV like rabbits, back in the day. No, no, no. He's Maltese as well. So, yeah, they're all the same, man. But um. Yeah. So there was a there was a lot of us. So no, I never really had problems in that sort of sense, like that deep. Um, it was maybe like a little fisty cuffs and whatever, but uh, yeah, not nothing major. Do you ever think about, or can you think about? I always find this question very interesting to hear responses from, but if you hadn't got into the boxing industry, yeah, yeah. what you possibly would be doing now? Yeah, uh, well, I probably would have carried on with the rugby and I was good enough to go somewhere. I would have, I, like, I still have coaches coming up to me who's like, listen, you should have stuck with the rugby. You would have played for Wales, this, that, and the other. But listen, we don't know what be could become of it. But if I didn't, do the boxing, and I didn't play rugby. There's only one way I was. It was gonna go. I was gonna probably end up in jail, which most of my family did, um, because they chose the wrong path. My dad done and my mum, they done everything in there. They give me everything, growing up. They advised me in the right way. My dad used to bring people out of rugby players, ex rugby players, people that are have done certain things in, in life that have, how can I say, positioned them in a, in a, a spot above her. So um, he always brought them to me, have a word with him. And it was a, there was a guy, I'm not going to name his name, you won't know him, but um, if anyone from Wales will see this, they'll know him. And um, he was a very good rugby player and he brought him to me and he, he, was like, he was like, have a word with him. So he was telling me and he said, his problem was w women. It's when I got he got to a level women and drink, and them two things when you're trying to achieve greatness in your sport, they just don't mix. So um, he said, yeah. So that that put me off straight away. Then when I started gambling, he brought someone that gambled to me. He explained to me. He said I should have been a millionaire. He said, but I'm on my ass. I got fuck all. So I was like, yeah, I better nip that in the bud then. Then he, um, and another one as well, there's a, a, a very good footballer from my area called Leon Jan, and he was playing for Arsenal at the time. Well, not at the time, but as growing up. And um, he was on big money a week and he was drinking, whatever. And he said to me the one day, and he went to see Joe, he said, and, and, and this is what he, he was telling me, he said, I chose the, to go down a road that, Everyone else in our area does, which is either selling drugs or fucking um, just a life of crime anyway, just doing a little petty shit, maybe robbing someone or doing whatever. He says, but 
he went to jail. He came out, he said, if I had the father you got, he said, I would have been the best football player to ever play for Wales. And I would have I would have carried on playing for Arsenal. I would have done everything I, and I, I would have been a multi-millionaire. So he said, if I had your father and your parents. So when he said that, and I was like, fucking you know, fair play. And I was like, OK. So then when all these things start s- s- sinking in and you think about things, I was like, OK. So then after the Olympics, I thought, fuck this, I can't, I've got to stop drinking, which I was only drinking for two years anyway. I wasn't a bad drinker, but I'd go out every weekend near enough and um, drink. And then... Was this before the Olympics? After. After the yeah, Olympics? Yeah, so I started drinking before the Olympics with, uh, after the Commonwealth Games, so for two years. Right. And then after the Olympics, I was like, fuck this. I got maybe seven, eight years to try and achieve something in the sport. I've got to maximise my chances. so And that's what I did, and I haven't touched a drink since. Just remind me, what was the gap between the Olympics and you actually turning pro? So, um, I, obviously, I came back from the Olympics in September, and then I, tu- I had my first fight April 22nd. So, about eight months? Yeah. So, all the way through that period, yeah. you were drinking, yeah? Yeah, so, well, t- till December. December, and then I didn't drink. Wow. It was the, so even, my birthday. Even after you turned my birthday part, was yeah. first of December. We went me, myself, Fraser Clark, Kez Ashfak and Goliath. Foy, they come down for my birthday, which they, they always used to come down there if I night out for me. And um on the third, then after that I didn't drink. So it was um yeah, I, I just had to maximise my chances. And I've I've done that now. How, how heavy was the drinking in that period? I wasn't like I wasn't like as if I'd go out Friday, Saturday, Sunday and be drinking. But when I drank, I was I didn't know a limit. I didn't know a limit. I just drink and drink and just you get to a point where you having a like you start feeling a bit tipsy and then yeah you don't because I don't like the taste of alcohol. But when you get that tipsy feeling, you don't mind the taste of alcohol. I could drink a sambuca and it's it's like it's water. So I'm drinking sambuca, champagne. And then the one day, and this is a reason, the really reason why I stopped. The one day, that, that day, I've left the club. They're all still there. Um, Galal, Fraser and all that. And they were with my cousins. So I've left the club. And as I've left the club, um, I've got to the cash point. I had money on me anyway, but I got to the cash point. Drew another 300 quid out. Jumped in a taxi. I must have gone... Sh- Straight like it was like a long down the long road. So and then we come up, come on to um, by the Cardiff Castle. Right, yeah. I was at the lights and I was going, oh, stop the car, stop the car, I'm gonna be sick. He's like, get out, get out, get out. So I, I cursed him, jumped out, and then from that moment I can't remember getting home. And my house, where I was living at the time, is about a good twenty minutes, half hour from there. And I can't remember. I didn't have a penny on me. So from that day I was like, fucking hell, what's going on? what happened so yeah it, that was that was sort of like the thingy but it, I wasn't I wasn't a bad drink away I was an alcoholic or anything but I, when I drunk I drunk yeah I've heard a few people say this uh, something you said about which I think is quite important to kind of people who drink um, whether it's excessively or not mm. is they don't like the taste of alcohol yeah. so the purpose of them drinking is yeah. to kind of to get to that level of like being yeah. intoxicated or tipsy or whatever you want yeah. to call it. But, yeah, I've heard people say they don't actually like yeah. the taste of alcohol. It's not about that. It's about yeah. where it kind of takes you. Yeah, of course. I, listen, I love the feeling of being drunk. Well, not so much drunk because sometimes you're a mess. You just absolutely talk shit, one. You can't hardly stand up when you're, when you're bollocks. Um, when you're tipsy, it's okay. You, you're, you're bubbly. But then there's, a, there's that... Fine line, it can isn't it? quickly go the other way. Yeah, and go left. So it's that fine line of being tipsy and then bollocks. So um, if I could, if I could, I, I, I'd probably be able to do it now because I got a lot of. Um, how can I say? Um, I can stop myself doing anything. Yeah. With a split second, so more self control. Self control. That's the word I'm looking for. So um, I'd be able to get to a certain point and stop. But then. Back then, I couldn't. I was just drinking, drinking. And because I'm out, and I wasn't coming in till like, 7 in the morning, my missus going mad. 
chucking shit at me. Um, me and my mate, and I'd always bring my, try and bring my mate back with me, so we, she didn't start, but she, in the end, she just got pissed off of it. But um, yeah, it was it was quite a yeah, it was some good times. I had some good times out. Joe, talk to me about a point in your life, not specific to boxing, mm. um, but where you felt as though you were fighting a losing battle in your life. Um. I mean, some of that stuff, what you're talking yeah. about, seems to relate to that. Yeah, so, uh, it was a time, I don't know if my man would be happy with me saying it, but my dad, he, when he went to, he went to jail, um, it was when I, when was it? it was, yeah, it was probably 2000 and 2008, 2009, and... Um, when he went to jail, obviously it's just me, and my mum, in the house. But then, like my dad would like kept us, so like there was no one bringing money in or whatever. And then, obviously in my head, I'm thinking, I, I gotta, I gotta try and earn money because my dad ain't around no more. But then I was, I started boxing, and I was, tr I just come back from the GBs. I just beat, um, I just won the GBs at the time. It was 2008 or 2009, I think. In 2009, it was. I just beat Josh Taylor in the final, so I would. I, I, Josh Taylor was unbelievable, especially as an amateur as well. So, and we started around about the same time, and we was um, yeah. So when it was that, when he went went to jail, I was like, you know, do I do this or do I carry on what I'm doing? So I I just wasn't sure where I was, mm. and I, like when I was going on runs and I'm there's all mad stuff going through my head and I'm questioning. Do I really want to box anymore? I was only boxing for two years anyway. Do I want to box anymore? And then I I went on a visit, and I didn't like it. I didn't like seeing my old man like my old man in there. Um, so I was like, okay, no problem. And then I thought, right, I gotta do this, do something now because he wouldn't want me to go that that way. He'd want me to carry on doing what I'm doing. So I just knuckled down, and then I I think, but it was at a point there was like. A couple of weeks of where I was like, mm, I don't know what I'm doing here, and then I thought, I had a I had a, I had a little sniff of that, and I thought, nah, and then I was carrying on boxing, but I just it just didn't feel right. Mm. It just didn't feel it didn't feel nice when I was training and going there. My head was all over the shop, and I, yeah, I just thought this is this is gonna go pear shaped. How did that end? I got I. Well, my my gym closed down as well, so that was a bad a bad patch. So I was training myself, and then I got myself onto Team GB. Um, trained myself. Um, I used to sneak in David Lloyd's in the morning, then sneak in another gym in the afternoon. Um, yeah, and then got myself onto Team GB, and then a few months later, my own man come up. What? What are the everyday battles for you today, away from boxing? What are they? Do you have them? Uh, yeah. Uh, I know it's not going to be specifically yeah. away from boxing as such, because no. boxing is your is your life. But what are the everyday battles for Joe Caldino? My mind. I'm quite mentally strong, but at the same time, I have I do have these like thoughts and stuff that float around in my head, and I've got to keep battling them. But like I said, I'm mentally strong, so I can get th I can get through it. And I've had I've had these for for years and years. Like not many people know, because I don't I don't open up to many people. Um, but like like I was saying to to my my mum and my my wife a couple of weeks back to come in, and they're always on about boxing to me. I said I said you know what? I said it's starting to fuck me off. I said no one ever ever comes to me and asks me how I am. Never, or rings me. There's always an agenda for someone ringing me. Oh, can you do this? Can you do this for me? Can you do that? Can you do this? And I, I, never, I never really ask anyone for anything. But when, I'm, when, when they ask me that, it's constant about boxing. And now, I could have had a bad day. Like, for instance, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, be making a, un, trying to make a unification. It's not happening. So my mind's thinking, of what's going on? Like, I'm thinking of all the other stuff that's going on behind the scenes. And they're going, yeah, when you're fighting next, I'm gonna, trying to have the luck to joke. I can't wait for your next fight. And I'm thinking, shut the fuck up. Like, and i got to try and explain. But then, 
I see someone 10 minutes later and then explaining. So my mind is going constant. And all I'm saying to myself is fucking just, just try and keep it down. Like, but it is, it is hard. But also outside of boxing is my kids. I miss my kids mm -hmm. dearly. Like my boy's birthday was on Monday. They left early hours in the morning. So I've missed another one of my kids' birthdays. I probably, I think I've missed all of their second birthdays. So I missed a lot of their birthdays, but um, yeah, it's my kids really. Do you know what? It's such an interesting thing you said because I had a conversation this couple of weeks ago mm. with someone, and if you say you got, say, seven people rung you in a day, for mm. example, mm. and when you really look at the seven people that rung you and you think to yourself, how many of them have actually just rung you and just gone, all right, what are you up yeah. to? Yeah. You good? Everything all right? Mm. What do you want? Nothing. Just seeing you yeah. right. Like, how often in a day or a week does that actually happen? Because for myself, I've probably got about two or three people that do that yeah. on like weekly. Like, I'll just they'll just ring me just for nothing. Yeah. And they won't ring me for to ask me anything yeah. specifically. They just ring me just like yeah. basically there's, just to talk. Bullets. There's not many. There's not no. many. Um, and there's there's one. Um, there's, there's about two or three. And one I grew up with, he's, he's fucking nuts. Uh, but he, he's like, yo, what's happening? All right, bro? Everything okay? And if he sees me post something online, he's like, yo, everything cool? You okay? I said, yeah, no problem. So, but then I got a, a Scottish mate. When I'm in camp, he'll ring me every night. Everything okay? You okay, what have you done today? Okay, how was it? And then we, we speak about golf yeah. and other shit. But and and at the start when I said about I don't like speaking about boxing, and he was like, he he won't mention boxing around me. But then I got another uh, mate as well. He'll ring me and just say, um, "Yo, what are you doing? Fancy coming in this place? Fancy coming our place?" I'm like, "Yeah, no problem." But but now my mum's starting to go, oh, "I love, how are you, love?" I said, "Don't fucking take the piss, don't take the piss." But now nah, she's they 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 don't really mention boxing around me now for the last few weeks. So. Um, yeah, because it, it was getting on top of me because the stuff that I was putting out on Twitter, like, no, I wasn't directing it at any specific person or mm. anyone or whatever, but they could see my frustration. But all they would ask me about, what's happening, what's going on, what's going on? And in the end, I went, listen, do not fucking speak to me about boxing. I said, because you're asking me the same thing. You've just, you've just come, you're asking me the same thing. And then if we'd have meals around the house, I say to my missus, I said, whoever's coming, I said, tell them before they come, do not ask me about boxing. I said, make sure. I said, otherwise I'll go just go upstairs and sit in my room. And then it's, no one asked me about boxing no more. Do, do you know what, what's mad? Like, when I'm out, like, I get people obviously mm. come up. But listen, it's not, they're asking me about, like, is so-and-so going to fight so-and-so? Yeah. Who's he next fight and things like that. So obviously mm. people are going to do that to me, like being involved yeah. in the sport that way. But when it's about you, mm. and it's like sometimes cool. you might you know, know what's going on. Do you know the thing is, do you know I expect it from people that don't know me and are strangers, and I don't mind speaking to them about it and explaining certain things. But it's do you know the people closest to you. Like if there's something that I need to say to you, and tell you about when I'm fighting next, I will tell you. Or you will see it on online. Why are the closest people to me asking me constantly and grilling me about boxing on a daily basis? That's what I don't get. And that's, that's, why, that's why I used to get pissed off with them. It's, it's the closest people to me. And yeah, it, it, in the end, now they don't do it. Like, he, like even my dad, my dad, he'll ring my mate. Have you mentioned? He won't mention it to me. Have you, have you, have you, have you mentioned anything to you? But I, I, I feel it's, it's different with boxing, but... I do feel like if you talk to someone about a field that they're not involved in, mm. then it's almost like you feel like you have to talk about... It's like getting in a cabinet mm. and going to the cabbie. Like, you know, you've been busy, been busy. tonight. <laughs> busy tonight. It's like you feel like busy you have drive. to have contribute to that person's yeah, profession. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bit different with boxing because it is so spoken about, yeah. but I can imagine it does when it's about you, mm. like, drive well, you mad. Before, it, it, it wasn't so bad when you're doing your fours and your six-rounders. Yeah, I'm fighting in this place. I'm fighting in that place. Want a ticket? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
But then now it was fucking. I didn't realize it was as bad as it, what it was. Trying to sort out a fight, it just it's not as easy as I thought. But and then when you you're having the stress of trying to sort all these stuff, this stuff out, um, then you've got people grilling you constantly about it. Yeah, it's like fucking. I'll leave it out. <laughs> Would you call yourself um, an emotional person? Like, when's the last time you were fighting back in the tears? Do you cry? Do you? I. I Probably haven't cried for about sixteen years. Really? I'm on my kid's life. Yeah. Nothing in, them, in that period has kind of made you no. that emotional. Why is that? Have you made yourself be like that, or? I don't know. I've tried. I've tried to because I've I've been in I've been sometimes where I've, I've I just, you just, I feel like I want to cry, but I just can't. And like, yeah, I've and I've. Sometimes I've got that lump in my throat, and I can feel a tear building, but it just won't. It, I just can't do it. it I don't know. It's it, that that I can't answer. You spoke about um, kind of that period of your life when you were talking about the drinking. But are you, which I'm assuming is kind of all connected to demons, possibly? Are you still fighting demons now? Would you say? Nah, no, 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 no. And going to the drinking, it wasn't a case of it was a problem it was like I didn't how can I say when you're on Team GB it's like a youth club so you're always around the boys you're always having the crack you're always having a joke and when I got and I didn't really go out like I didn't really have an 18th birthday I didn't have a 21st and then when I got to after the Commonwealth Games and you got a little bit of uh, clout about you and you're on the BBC and whatever and then you come in if I come back and then people are congratulating you, well done, Joe, and you're going on one night out with your mates. And then you're like, oh, I like, I fucking like all this attention. And then you're going out the next week and they're having the same and then it's the same shit. But so that's what it was. It wasn't a case of I want, I was hiding anything through the drink. It was just, I was going out, I liked the attention, but when I was out, I would just go mad with it. I wasn't holding back mm. and I'd come in like a mess. So, Joe, you fight for your family and Wales and wherever else and who fights for you like who's in your corner um, who's there for you regardless of what situation you're in who'd you turn to my family my family uh, if if anything goes like goes in pear shape or whatever I go to my family but it it depends of what sort of thing it is do you understand so, like, I've got a lot of cousins that I'll go to for certain things. But if it's an emotional thing, I'll go to maybe my my mum or my dad or my wife. But, yeah, it just depends what it is. But it's mainly my family. My family. Do you believe boxing to have um, contributed to any spates of depression for you in that time? Yeah. Yeah. That... When I done my hand the twice, because um, the first time it was quite a bad one, and I done my metacarpals, they took bone from my hip, and put it in my hand and whatever. So that was yeah, that was that was quite bad because I was out for a while, I think over a year. So um, yeah, I think it was about fifteen months so I was out. So yeah, it was that was quite depressing, and phew, you're not earning any dough. I was only on what. Well, how many fights was I in? Uh, I think it was like a seven or eight fights in. Probably less than that. So yeah, this is um, yeah, it was quite it was quite. I had mad thoughts, put it that way. I had mad thoughts because I got, I had two kids I had to provide for. And then when I demand the second time, I've just won a world title, a lifetime of work, just gone right down the hill, and. I'm left in the dark. I, I'm, I like I had a meeting the other day, ready, and I and I was explaining a couple of things, and I just said like I just didn't, I didn't have a, a text or a phone call of anyone there, so I was just explaining to her how I felt. I didn't have a text or a phone call of anyone, so I said I I just felt in the dark, and and that was that, which I I did. So um, yeah, it was it was quite it was quite like a, I don't want to say depressed depressed. Because I don't like chucking that around because people are depressed out there. Um, but if I had to describe 
uh, feeling. That's what I'd probably describe it as. How did you cope with that? Uh, Call of Duty. I was sat in my bedroom, didn't leave my bedroom for ages. I had a couple of my mates, uh, PG, Reiki, and we are just in there playing thing, and then I'd go, I'd maybe go for a bike ride now and again. Um, but yeah, but then when I'd done it a second time, yeah, that was that was quite tough. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to do nothing. I didn't want to get off the sofa. I was on the sofa for ages. Uh, I couldn't even even go for a run or go to the go to the gym and do n nothing. How common do you think depression is in boxing? I look at people like the situation we're living with Connor over the last ten months, mm. and you can't tell me that Connor hasn't gone through oh, severe exactly. bouts of yeah, yeah. depression. It's, his whole world's come kind of been turned upside down. But how common do you think depression is in boxing? Oh no no no, it's 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 real. Put it that way. It's um yeah, it's no joke because you've got to remember you're putting your life on a line. We are putting our life on a line because not only do you graft and put your body and take your body to the limits in training and then sacrifice everything, then you're fighting and potentially um risking your life to feed your family and sometimes things don't go the same the the way you want it to go you don't expect like fight after fight you oh, this this fight's next this money this fight's after that that money and they don't actually work out like that sometimes so sometimes this and you've seen it in the past with with um fighters from back in the day where they where they come out and explain certain things of their situation and what happened like I know um uh, what's in Ricky Burns, for instance? Ricky Burns had a lot of problems, and he he was explaining to me uh, over the years of what happened, like not what happened, but his situation. So, for him to be a three weight world champion, um, and profile wise, not as big as the likes of your Conor Benz, and you do all what you've done in the sport not to get the the fruits of it, so. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely out there, but like, uh, saying Connor, Connor have had some bad, bad um, the, the especially the last year, or so, it's been very bad, mm -hmm. and only now he's uh, in the last couple of weeks or maybe months, the months come out of um, come out of his shell. Mm -hmm. How old are you now? Thirty two in December. Thirty two. So. If you could go back in time, hypothetically, yeah. and as you are now, 32-year-old Joe Cordina, you yeah. could give advice to a 21-year-old Joe Cordina, what would you say? A 21-year-old? Yeah, what would you say? Mm. Well, it's what, I'd be, uh, what I say to all the other youngsters that are boxing at that age, because they, they want to turn pro, they want to do this. Um, they, they want that sort of that title of as a professional fighter. I say, listen, stay as amateur as long as you can. Try and get to an Olympic Games, try and get to a Commonwealth Games, win a major tournament, or try and get on Team GB. I said, because that gives you a head start. I've seen so many fighters that have haven't done nothing as an amateur, or done loads of stuff as a, a schoolboy and a youth boxer, and decided to turn pro at 18. And then they get hit with reality. It's not all what it's made up to be. Because there's no money in boxing unless you you've actually done something. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, it's quite um, it's quite a, I wouldn't say upsetting, but it's quite uh, difficult when I see youngsters that get fed all this bullshit to certain uh, by certain people, and then there's nothing at the end of it. So if I had to say something, is sacrifice. Yeah. Take that little that extra year or two, stay amateur, try and do something, and then, and then, uh, well, that's what I did. And a lot of the GB boys done that, who's su as successful now. Like your likes of Pat McCormack stayed on, Fraser Clark stayed on for a, lo a long time. Galal Yafai, um, loads, load of them. Kyle Yafai stayed on ag again, when they become world champion. Um, load of them, so it's, it's proven that 
if you get on Team GB, you keep progressing, you keep building, you keep winning, you've got more of a chance to become a world champion than someone that is not as experienced as, as, uh, as fighting top level opposition yeah. week in or month in, month out, than someone that's just be just become a uh, ABA schoolboy champion or a youth champion or just won the ABAs and turning pro. You're going to have a much better chance of doing something in the sport. Hmm. Okay, last one. I can answer this however you perceive the question. Um, what drives that fight within you? What is it? What are the factors that still drive Joe Cordina, that fight within you? There's a there's a couple um, a couple of things. There's one is not disappointing my mother and father. Um, that's one of my worst fears, is them being disappointed in me. So that's one. And like I said to you, when I'm fighting, if my mum and dad's watching, you're gonna have to nail me to the floor, because whether you put me over, I'll get up. You're gonna have to put me a kip sleep. So. Um, yeah, so that's one, and also my kids. I want them to have what I had and more growing up. Um, I want them to live the best life. Although I don't want to be, them to be spoiled, but I want them to show them what's right from wrong and wrong from right and whatever. But yeah, they. I want to. How can I say? When I when I used to when I used to watch like the footballers on the TV or the rugby players, and I used to see them, my eyes used to light up. Not so much boxing as a kid, because I didn't really watch much boxing as a yeah. kid. But when I used to see these, I used to light up. Now I'm mates with all the rugby players, mates with all the footballers. So it's like, it's like when, when I used to see them, and I used to I see, oh, I said, I want to be like them when I'm older. And like, have a nice car, um, have a nice house, have money in your bank, have money in your pocket, be able to do whatever you want to do. That's that that's all them three things is the the main thing for me. Like yesterday I was Bugsy Malone, I seen Bugsy drive past. I was sat in Brentwood Kitchen, so I messaged him, he was like I'm in Nando's. I'm Brentwood High Street man. So I said I'll pass through. So I've gone. He sat in there on his own. So I sat with him for about an hour. But we were having a chat and just to see how he his mind works and how he, he, he knows where he's going. Like he was saying, I know where I'm going. And how deep he is and how he, his thought process is. And, and he said a few things to me yesterday and I was like, fair play, nah, that's, that's it. And I, it played on my mind when I came back and I was like, okay. But to see how, like same again, with where he's come from. Even though we're, we're, we're on the same journey, he's there. He's at the top of his game. I'm at the top of my game, but I still want. I still got a few things to do. You want to be like these people, do you understand? You want to be like him. You want to be like the the footballers who used to watch the rugby players who used to watch. So, yeah, these them them three things. Not disappointing my mother and father, my kids, and trying to be like the people I used to look up to. Yeah. So, yeah, that's they're the three the three things I'd say. Who is it that blanked you for a photograph? Uh, there's. Three is it a football of them. Yeah, three of them. There was Iniesta, um, Modric, and he was with Kovacic, is it? The Chelsea player. Yeah, so, but Kovacic wanted to, you could see he wanted to give me one, but where Modric just was like, oh, nah, later. I was like, where the, how the fuck am I going to see you later, mate? <laughs> You're walking around the fucking mall in the World Cup. It's packed, man. Later. Yeah, later. Yeah, I'll come to your hotel. I'll come to your room. Is it? Tell me what room you're at. Silly fucker. <laughs> but yeah, it was. Um, yeah, they are fuckers. Huh? I couldn't remember who it was. Yeah. Okay, Joe Cordino, Listen, much appreciate it. Genuinely, I know I've interviewed you obviously mm. for quite some time now, but we've never spoke like this, and I've never mm. heard a lot of this stuff before. Mm. So I do appreciate you right, uh, talking about some of this stuff, and uh, it's weird because like. A lot of our interviews are all pretty much the same. It's like yeah, yeah. about fights and the upcoming things and like post fight, etc. So it's good to get this chat. Because uh, when you see me next, don't ask me about boxing. I won't. Just ask, no, me, I'm how, just ask me how I am. Do you know what? When I interview you next, yeah. like just for <laughs> IFL, I'm not even going to ask you about that. I'm just going to go, all right, mate. 
<laughs> um, Joe, thank you very much. No worries, my man. Guys, thank you for listening uh, and watching, or both. We will see you next week. Make sure you comment, like, and subscribe. We are out. Join us for the very first IFL Live at London's Indigo at the O2, Sunday, August the 13th, with me, Coogan Cassius, and some very special guests, Eddie Hearn, Darren Barker, Johnny Fisher, and more. Tickets now on sale. So in the words of Eddie Hearn... You get up, you dress up, and you fucking shell up. <laughs>